Um, so uh, you can turn there to Exodus chapter 3. Uh, Tonight's not going to be a long message, although don't ever trust the pastor when they say that. Um, it seldom happens that that can be the case. But this, this evening I just want to look at the concept of God cannot be boxed. And when we are on mission with God, how important it is for us to be aware of God at work. Um, sometimes we get into a mindset that we think God is going to work in this way, um, yet he works in a different way. And sometimes we expect him to work in one way, and he does something completely different from what we expected in our personal lives, and also just how he draws people to himself, how he achieves his purposes um, in this world um, every single day through a variety of different things. And and not so, and and not less. And I mean, and as much the case is with Moses. We know what has happened in the Exodus, and we're going to cross over to the New Testament all the time throughout the weekend. But we know what's happened. Um, we know that Moses has been has grown up in Pharaoh's courts for a very specific purpose. He's he has killed somebody. He's been noticed. Um, he suddenly becomes aware of that. He runs away. And he's now away from the people, and God is wanting to send him back to go and lead the people to deliverance. And they need deliverance, and he wants to, um, for them to be led back um, out, of the, out of captivity. And so chapter 3 says, Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that through the bush, though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. And so Moses thought, I will go over and see the strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. And when the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. I'm going to just read that far um, this, this evening um, because a lot of the story is going to come out along the way. And, and uh, I just want to really speak about just the concept of that God cannot be boxed. And I love the, uh, the, the quote from C.S. Lewis and the, um, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. And uh, it's about God not being safe. Now, there's a picture that's going to come up on the screen and I want to just see if any of you know exactly where that lamppost is. Um, does anyone know anything about that particular lamppost? Anyone? Forest? Okay, so no, that is in Oxford in the UK. That is outside C.S. Lewis's office, um, where The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe was written. And uh, how many of you have ever read those books, just out of interest? So, you know how Lucy goes out and she encounters the lamppost in the snow? That's the lamppost. Um, so, we went there. It was very special for us. And, and there is one scene, it says, where um, the beaver is, is, and Lucy are speaking, and the beaver says, Aslan is a lion. Is a lion the lion? Oh, said Susan. Rather, not, not um, Lucy. I thought he was a, a man. Is he quite safe? I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. Safe, said Mr. Beaver. Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he is good. He's a king after all, I tell you. And I want to just say to you this evening, there, there, as we speak about mission and on mission with God, uh, there is just this realization that God often wants to work in ways that we don't necessarily understand. Uh, we know his ways are not our ways, and we have to be aware and ready for that when that happens. Um, I love the story of the revivals that happened around Cape Town um, in the 1800s where um, Andrew Murray was involved in those. Many of you might have read the stories. They are wonderful stories to read just on how God moved in uh, all the different little towns around Cape Town. In actual fact, Wellington, Worcester, Montague, on the farms around that whole area, how farm workers just began to pray, how people began to pray, and how God moved. And, and there's one of the stories and that goes with, and there was a meeting, a particular meeting that they were praying, and, 
and really just asking God to work in a powerful, powerful way. And a lady, a young colored lady came in the back of the door, one of the farm workers, and, and suddenly she began to pray in the midst of all this prayer that was happening. It was just really quiet prayer that was happening. And, and as this lady began to pray, this young lady began to pray, God began to do something so deeply significant in the midst of all of what they were doing on that time. And, and uh, Andrew Murray, for a moment, tried to stop it because uh, he was a man of order. He loved things to be done in order, like so many of us like things to be done in order, and, and, and just didn't want to stop. And it just carried on and carried on. And God was doing it, changing people's hearts and changing people's lives. And they prayed for it for years. Andrew Murray had prayed for it for almost... 30 years with some of his family members. They had prayed for this revival. But when the revival came, he didn't expect it to come in the way that it did. Later on at a prayer meeting, um, there were a lot of people, and it was, it's described, that particular prayer meeting was described as a labor room. Of, you know, in terms of, I've only been in the labor room when, my, when Heidi gave birth to Christopher and Caitlin, so I don't know all the sounds. But um, it was like a labor room. There was just this really... This, um, this murmuring and, and this seeking God. And, and Andrew Murray went around trying to keep the people quiet. And, and somebody stood up and said, Mr. Murray or Reverend Murray, you are not going to stop what God is doing in this place. As much as you may want to try, you are not going to stop it because God is moving in this place. And I want to say to you that as we look at throughout the, the Old Testament as we look through the New Testament, there are just indications all over the place of God working in ways that probably we wouldn't think of him working of. And I want to just read a couple of them that don't fit into perhaps the box that we understand. Where there's the one where Gideon has to go and take away. He's going to, into a battle to fight thousands and thousands of people. They've all got chariots and horses and they've got massive armies and he goes into this army and he wants to take these men with these God with them. And, and God just takes him and, and little bit by little bit, he whittles them down to 300 men. He says, these are the people that you're going to use um, in this battle. And, and we wouldn't do a battle like that. Uh, it's just not what we would do. We know that um, we know David goes to battle with Goliath with a sling. All those have swords and, and shields and the right kind of equipment and they are afraid, and, and David says, you know, with God, I can do all things. We know that uh, there is the donkey that God uses to speak through. There's a Roman cross that the Son of God dies on. Who would ever imagine that the king of the universe would be born of a virgin in a stable? There are all these crazy analogies. They're not crazy because this was part of God's plan and God's um, will, but we recognize that God doesn't always work the way that we Expect him to work or think he's going to work. And when we are talking about being on mission with God, we have to recognize this and we have to understand that this is indeed actually the case in so many different ways. And so this weekend is going to be about you coming before God, really, just with expectation to ask God that you could even, he could even work here as part of the mission that God has laid on your life. And what I mean by that is something that I speak to our congregation about all the time. I mean, it's something that fortunately, and I just the other day I began to hear people speaking about it and without me saying anything. I just said, you know, a lot of the ministry of Jesus was about divine interruptions. You know, we have a plan, and the plan for this weekend, for instance, is that I'm going to stand up here and I'm going to preach on Friday night. Tomorrow morning I'm going to preach twice. Um, you're going to have a lot of fun. There's all these plans that are arranged. On Sunday morning we've got things planned. And there's nothing wrong with planning that. On Sunday evening there's something planned. And, and there's nothing wrong with planning that. But, but we have to be also be aware that amidst our plans, God is wanting to do something. And we have speak about divine interruptions. How along the road Jesus somebody would come up and, and touch Jesus' coat. And there would be this incredible moment, this interruption, where Jesus would stop. And he would say, okay, now we're going to give this attention. And we want to give this attention because this is now 
part of what God the Father wants me to do and this, this, this understanding of the Father's will in the midst of it. Or he would walk past a tree and there would be this little person up in the tree and, and um, he'd say, come down, and there would be this whole interaction of forgiveness of sins and all kinds of things that would be happening in the moment. He would preach to the thousands. Yes, we know that he preached the most amazing sermon on the Sermon on the, of, the, of the Mount. We know that he gathered thousands of people and people listened to him and he did the things, but it was in those divine interruptions that God so often worked. I can remember a church camp, well, in actual fact, it was a youth camp in, in, Pretoria, in, in Cape Town where um, I was just asked to help with the driving. And the camp had been a wonderful success, and at the end of the camp, um, I was asked to be one of the drivers. I went out to go and fetch a whole group of young people. And on the way back, not my car, but the bus that a lot of the young people were in broke down. And God had worked in the camp, but I remember that walk that we had to take with all these young people. And how, at the end of this camp, God interrupted that trip back home to work in a very deep and very significant way. Because some of the conversations that were had and some of the commitments that happened along that way, along that path, along that road, were deeply, deeply spiritual moments with these teenagers, these young people um, who, who really needed this, this intervention. And so as believers and as followers of Jesus Christ, we must be looking for solutions in places that the world is not searching for them. As believers, we need to be aware in the times that we are living in right now, with all the upheaval that is happening in the land, in the country, and in the world, with earthquakes that are happening around the world, with the kind of stuff that's going on in our own country, we must be looking for solutions in places where the world is not looking for them. We need to be looking to God in the midst of, of all these things to ask Him, how is He working? How is He working in my life? Who is it that he wants me to have a conversation with this weekend? May he open that door. And when he opens that door, if I'm busy with something else, let me stop what I'm doing so that I can do the thing that God has opened the door for. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was thinking about this particular thing, and I was thinking, a couple of years ago, I built a guitar. I love woodwork, and so I was busy doing that, and and, so, and I kind of documented it on Facebook just step by step. And the documentation was really just to keep me motivated because people were saying to me, you know, keep going, keep going, do this, do that, and whatever. And I bought this guitar. And, and what happened was there was a, a friend of mine who, who saw this. And he was a guitarist. And he was, well, he wasn't really a friend, to be honest with you. He was somebody that I knew from school. And school had been some 20 years or 25 years at that stage or even a little bit more years before that. And Dougie contacted me. He was up in Johannesburg, and he sent me a message on Facebook, and he said, it's so cool that you're doing this, and I play guitar uh, in a lot of the pubs around Cape Town. You know, can we meet up sometime just to, to chat? And I, and I could have said to him, no, you know, because I knew, when I knew him at school, he was a rebel, and he was off track. And, uh, and in the moment, I said to him, yes, let's meet up. Come and have a look at the guitar, and let's just meet up for a cup of coffee. That conversation became one of the most amazing journeys um, that could ever have happened. Because he came to our house, but he came to our house as a broken man. He had been up here in Johannesburg, and he'd been playing and, um, and he had been married, and his wife had said to him, enough is enough, for various reasons. And she said, I'm out of here, and you need to leave. And she took what he, she could, and, and he was really left with very little. And he was himself saying to me, Basil, you know, this is my own doing. And I can remember just the conversations that began to start as a result of that. And he came to Cape Town, and then the, the partner that he had in Cape Town ripped him off. And he was at the end of himself, and we began to talk, and we began to just from time to time meet up. And 
Once or twice, Christopher and I went and watched him play and, and listened to him play. I remember he, he loved um, Eric Clapton. We loved Eric Clapton as well. So every time he played something, uh, we would love it. And, and then the day came where he phoned me up and said to me, Basil, I'm, I've got cancer. And I can remember riding from where we were in Durbanville to, to Bloberg, if any of you know the route. And I'm like, Lord, what am I going to say to this man? I know that he's far from you. I know that, he, I know that he's searching. And I can remember praying, Lord, that prayer of Ephesians chapter 3 that says, um, Paul's prayer for the church. He says, I pray that you may grasp together with all the saints how high and how long and how wide and how deep is the love of God is for you in Christ Jesus our Lord. And that you may encounter him as a God who is able to do immeasurably more than all you could ever ask or even dare to imagine. Lord, just help me in this moment to say what you want me to say. And, um, and then I met with him. And I, I just remember him being so spiritually open. And that journey went all the way to the hospital to Tigerberg Hospital, where I sat with him at his bedside, and a couple of weeks later, he passed away, but we had prayed together, and he had come to know the Lord, and he had come to recommit, because he had committed his life to the Lord when he was a little boy. And then I met his sister, and his sister became, started telling me, because she came for the funeral, and she started telling me some of the things that God was doing where she was. She was working as a missionary on the on the Syrian border with Operation Mobilization. And uh, she, they just set up tent and camp outside Syria um, as Operation Mobilization. And they just wel welcomed everybody who was running away from the Taliban and everybody that, at the time. And they came into these camps. And many of the people who came into those camps had said to them, we've never heard about this man, Jesus, but we had this vision. We had this, this picture sometime in the night, this dream that we had. And and we, we realized we had to find out more. Do you know anything about this man, Jesus? And then they could say to them, yes, we do. And I can remember just thinking this one little conversation, this one interruption that led to all these different interactions. The day of his funeral, there were people in that building that Dougie's life had touched who would never, ever have been in that building for any reason whatsoever. And I can remember his sister saying to me, Basil, we just need to preach the gospel here. Every one of these people needs to hear um, about Jesus. And, and if you had to ask me to have mapped out what had happened and how that was going to happen, I would never, ever be able to do it. Because God did something significant. We even, he was a, Dougie was a big guy. And we even you know, joked afterwards because we had to put his ashes into two boxes and not one because like, he was too big uh, for one box. And when we... We knew the influence that he had in so many people's lives. And he was just a lovely, lovely guy who had, at the time was far from God and who just needed somebody to be aware. And I want to just say to you, you need to be aware of how God wants to use you on his mission in this world. We may think it's going to happen like this, but it may happen very differently. And we must be aware and open and every day, if we are really serious about being on mission with God, every day of our lives, say, Lord, you open a door. And when I see that door is open, give me the courage, give me the boldness to walk through that door. If that door opens, and it's somebody that I don't expect for that door to open with, give me the courage to walk through. I, I remember... Um, and this was a couple of years ago, we were, I was, walked into a group of people, and they were sitting around in a circle, and you know how sometimes um, Dormanis get the back end of the joke you know, when it is in that kind of situation, and, and so there were these guys, there were 10 or 15 of them around in the circle, and, and they let me have it, they, they let me, and they told me what they thought of Christians, and they weren't believers. And they wanted to tell me every story that they'd heard of every pastor who had fallen and who had made a mistake and who had made a mess of their lives. I'm like, dudes, I know about these stories. You don't need to tell me about these stories. But they needed to tell me. They needed to tell me 
how much Christians are hypocrites and how you know, fast we are really. And sometimes really we are, but, but and I need to admit that. And, and so they just carried on, carried on, carried on, and they were going at me. And I just kind of, I just um, listened to them and we just carried on chatting and I eventually changed the subject. But a little later, I had to go off somewhere. And one of the guys, unbeknown to me, who was sitting in that circle, had deep spiritual questions. And as I had went off, he came up to me and he said to me, can I just come with you? And then from the moment we climbed in the car until the moment we got out, we just spoke things of the Lord. And even in the midst of all of that antagonism, there was a searching heart. God is not confined to the way that we think he must work. We cannot box him. And I want you to be open um, to his working and how he wants to use you. Not just tonight and tomorrow and the next day. Sometimes we think of being on mission with God about going somewhere, doing something. But in your workplace, in your home, at university, at, around the dinner table, are you sensitive to the work of God's Spirit? And, and that's my challenge, really, um, for you this evening. Let's spend a moment in prayer and then I'm going to close. Father, thank you so much for, just for the fact, Lord, that we can, we can work, we can see you working, Lord, in the midst of chaos, in the midst of difficulty, in the midst of pain. Lord, there is so much of that happening in our world today. And we are on mission with you, Lord. You have given us a commission. You have told us to go into the world. You have told us that we are to be salt and light. And we pray, Lord, that we won't get caught up in all the emotion of what is going on around us in the country and in the world. And, Lord, that we would be sensitive to what you are doing. Lord, you give us access to people, different kinds of people at different times of our lives, Lord, and and many of those people are in desperate need of a Savior. They are desperate in need, in need of you. And we just think of the Duggies in our lives, Lord. And we think of the friends of the Duggies. And Lord, we just pray that you would help us to remain sensitive to whatever it is that you do. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.